And we are live. Data storytellers, I have Javier Sabio here with me on the show. He is the executive director and head of advanced analytics and algorithmic trading over at BBVA. For our North American listeners who might not be familiar with BBVA, BBVA is one of the largest and I think oldest financial institutions in Europe. Um, Javier, thank you for being here with me and welcome on the show. Hi, thank you very much for having me. And it's really exciting to be here. It's our pleasure. So Javier, you had a really interesting journey uh, as a data leader. Uh, would you mind just introducing your background here and what you're working on at the moment over at BBVA? Sure. Yeah, well, I am, I mean, my training is in, I am physicist, right? I, I did uh, theoretical physics, physics uh, a few years ago and also a PhD in theoretical condensed matter physics, which in the end it was more like particle physics than um, materials physics, let's say, because it's, <laughs> the, the mathematics were quite, let's say, yeah, complicated, let's say um, more, more oriented to the theoretical world. But, uh, but it was a good experience, right? I, I learned a lot about uh, how to solve things with mathematics and uh, yeah, it was, it was great. The thing is uh, when I finished, I, I think as it happens with many, many people that are working in the, in the research world, I just thought that, well, uh, I would like to do something that has a maybe more uh, explicit contribution, right? More direct contribution in my work, because in the end, in research, it's great, but you are, you're part of a big project in the, uh, shared with many other researchers, but the, this is a very long-term uh, goal, right? Uh, at least in these kind of topics I was working so I I thought well I would could do a, try something in the, in a business where I can maybe I mean my, my contribution is not as relevant globally on the long term of course but uh, there is an impact you can see right and, and you can and, and the natural thing I guess for a, someone who has a mathematical background in is, is the financial industry because uh, at the time there were a lot of jobs regarding the what, what is called quantitative analysis or quant which is people who, it's not really data science in the sense of that we understand right now, although there are there are many things that nowadays are called data science, but at the moment nobody bothered to, to give them a name. But uh, it's more about using mathematical models to to do like uh, the prices of complex derivatives. And this is one of the big business of banks, right? Like you, you want your clients, they want to have a specific... Uh, bets on the market or, or they want to hedge some of the risk of the market and you provide them with fine-tuned products that they that they use to do these uh, investments or, they, or to manage the risk and in order to sort of manufacture these these products you need mathematical models uh, to construct the price and to and to help the bank itself to hedge the risk of this price because the banks usually just want to to make money out of the commissions uh, they charge for this kind of products, not really by taking the opposite bet from the client. I mean, the client might want a product that uh, he or she makes money. Uh, if the market goes up, uh, you don't want to be on the other side. You just want to offer the product and then hedge your position. So this is a, for this, you need this, this kind of mathematical model. Some people know that this, they call it Black Souls, formalisms, I don't know. Um, so I started with that and I was doing this until uh, 2014. I moved to Citibank in London. And, and there I changed sort of what I was doing. It, it was starting to be the, this data revolution in the financial industry. And, and I, I joined City to work in, in flow products, which means instead of this sophisticated, fine-tuned, uh, tailored to customers products, we are just trading on the, on the simple standard contracts that uh, are well-defined. And uh, let's say instead of closing an operation every week or every day as much, uh, here we have thousands of trades every day and, um, and we are just facilitating customers to be able to buy or sell these instruments of these contracts whenever they want what is called liquidity provision so it's, it's a different function where um, data becomes like a large component right and data you can use it for improving decision making of course uh, for the business but also to automate the the business right the uh, and, and this is a, a, a big part. I was starting to get 
involved at the time and learning and, uh, and really getting into it, like, what is called algorithmic trading, which is uh, essentially, uh, I'm not on, only going to use this data to help the business, to, to help the, the traders or the salespeople who are developing the business, but we are also going to produce um, these algorithms that will handle themselves the business, right? Uh, of course, supervised by, by business units, but uh, but they have their own their own sort of business, right? And with this background and this uh, experience, uh, well, with Brexit and also because I <laughs> started a family and so on, we decided to, re to relocate to, to Spain and I had the opportunity to to become the the head of this uh, now it's called Advanced Analytics Algorithmic Training Team that was recently created in BBVA. Um, to handle sort of this transformation, right? We were asking about the what what is what we are doing. In some sense, uh, yeah, we are helping this business, which trade have a lot of data. They have a lot of they, they trade very frequently in BBVA. We try to give them tools to improve their decision making and, and to automate the, the activity because uh, there are a lot of players here. There are a lot of uh, competition and and cost reduction is is, is is key, right? And one of the one of the things you can do to, to reduce cost, of course, is to automate the, some of the activities. So the people, it's not that you are replacing people, but you are allowing people to focus the, the business, to focus more on on where the marginal value is, is higher, right? Maybe because we, with, with all this, in the recent years, we have more and more financial products that are uh, traded uh, electronically. So it means like instead of traditionally, you would go to so give a call to your bank and, and they will uh, yeah, trade I mean, and give you a price and you will sort of bargain and, and get the trade done. Well, now you go to a computer as or your mobile phone and you, you, you request a price automatically to the bank and, and then you, you will close or not the, the operation, right? Uh, and, and this, of course, it implies that you can, there is a lot of this activity. Now uh, we have thousands or, or of this, uh, operations coming and if you want to have people handling all of them you need a large uh, workforce right you need to increase it because uh, the electronification is covering more and more products so automation is, is a way of, of of keeping the same people focused uh, and, and taking out of them all this of this uh, large amount of activity that sometimes is not uh, adding a lot of value but this is relevant uh, when you count all of them, I mean, all, all the trades, and all the, all the things that are, we are working. So, so yeah, and this is a bit the, the mission we have in the team, right? Is I always emphasize we want to do scientific um, solutions and not really only data-driven solutions. Why, why do I say so? Because um, I mean, data-driven is fine. I mean, we have a lot of data, but we also want to, we, we want to combine this data with also with the business knowledge, with the, with the domain expertise that we have in a, in a scientific manner, right? That we, we have a, we put a model that exploits this data. We observe what it's doing. We run it with the business. We see if we can sort of incorporate information from, from the business into the, into the model that uh, uh, helps it to work better or they feel more comfortable with it. And then we observe again the output and so on. And we keep on improving and experimenting. So it's it's data driven, but it's it's also uh, I mean with a, with, with a focus also in a, uh, yeah in a, in a scientific way of, of doing things. No, we just we don't want just to have models that learn from data and do it everything automatically without control. We we want to have uh, the business a partner, and we want to to be able to um, to challenge the model and to incorporate business knowledge when it's necessary. Uh, so for that we are very pragmatic. No, sometimes the solution to a problem. That the business is raising is not necessarily like a sophisticated machine learning model or something like that. We we might use different tools, but uh, in the end, is um, in order to to give value to the to the business, right? Mm. I have so many questions because uh, you've been in this field for a while, so you probably have a bunch of insights about how the perception of data changed in the financial industry it being a highly regulated sector as well. I imagine that implementing change can be a real struggle and a real challenge, even though it's highly competitive as well. So there's a huge pressure on creating advantage. But before we go there, uh, something caught my ear 
when you were talking about your background in theoretical physics. Actually, few people know that um, for a while after I uh, arrived in London, like a long time ago, uh, I did want to go into theoretical physics. I actually w w wanted to go to university and study uh, philosophy and physics. Right? And actually, one of the reasons why I decided uh, not to go all in on that was something similar to what you mentioned of not actually seeing real results of what you do. Also, theoretical physics in and of itself, I think it's been stagnant for a little while, meaning that for the past couple of decades, there hasn't been like real substantial uh, progress, like string theory was maybe sort of a dead end kind of thing. Um, so just you having already made that jump and you already spent a lot of time in data working on the business side. There are a lot of people listening as well who are incredibly talented, but maybe are still at the crossroads of deciding whether they would go the theoretical route or maybe they should try themselves in business. In your reflection, uh, what would be your word of advice for people who are talented, super intelligent, interested in data-driven processes? Uh, what is your experience now working in business? Would you recommend them uh, doing something similar that you've done? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I guess it depends a lot on the profile in the end, right? The, the person, uh, you need to... Because sometimes people, they just really like uh, all this uh, theoretical formalism and, and, and just doing this research and, and understanding better. They have a, a very complex problem, but it's a well-defined one and, and they want to push it. And this is what they want to devote their lives to. So in that sense, if that's what makes you happy, <laughs> I cannot say go to a business. But if you have this sort of uh, uh, impression, I think everyone, mostly when you are doing a PhD, you, you know what you are, what I'm meaning. Because at some point you sort of feel what the hell am I doing here, right? Uh, what uh, what is this contribution I am doing? Why why I still come every day here to solve this problem? What is the impact and so on? If you start to have these questions, definitely my my suggestion is to is to try. I mean, you can try. I mean, it's it's not that your career is necessarily finished. Did you did you tried something in business and and then come back? I, I have seen people who did that and and they have developed a successful research career later. So it's uh, it's possible as well to try and to see if you like it. Uh, if you see the, of course, because one of the things you have to understand when you go to the business is that uh, you don't have you no longer have this uh, very clear problem that you can work and focus mostly as you do in the PhD, right? You you start having suddenly a lot of things that are not particularly theoretical or just enjoyable. Let's say <laughs> there are things you need to do a lot of support. There are um, politics that you need to handle, you need to do project management, you need to, um, yeah, I mean, sometimes simply things that don't work, <laughs> you need to fix them, you need to analyze why. There's a lot of programming, um, uh, if you like programming, that's great, but if it's not what you really like, well, normally in, in a business, there is always a degree of programming uh, that you need to do. So things are not that, that simple. Mm. I wouldn't say simple for someone who is doing a long-term research career as well because uh, i see my friends who who are stay, still in the research world and, and they no longer have the benefit of course as well of just uh, analyzing and understanding this uh, concrete problem they're working in. i mean they also have they have to request projects and they need to they have phd students of their own and they need to supervise uh, and there is also politics in the <laughs> in the departments in the university so i mean but but maybe when you when you come from a PhD where you can you have the opportunity to focus more on a problem, you you, you might feel panic something at the moment you go to the business and it's like okay uh, yeah I can devote twenty percent of my time to the interesting problem but then there is eighty percent of time I need to devote to things that probably are not the ones I I, I feel I was trained for right mm -hmm. this is something that they have to be aware on the other hand uh, there is the impact. Of course, the, you are going to see that direct impact of your work in the, in, at least if you go to the right place. And this is something that probably we can discuss a lot because uh, uh, it's true that in the recent years uh, with, with the data science hype that uh, has been, a lot of business have created data science units, um, but they didn't have a particular purpose for them. So it can happen as well that you go to a business where data it's not really mature. Uh, the, the, what, how can you apply the data to the to the business, or you don't have infrastructure or anything, and then you don't even have a, 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 an impact uh, in the business because there is not much to do. So I, I don't know. As, as everything, there are trade-offs, right, between uh, 
there are risks and there are there are benefits as everything mostly in the financial markets but uh summarizing what you were asking yeah, i mean i think if you think you have this uh, these people the, that you 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 have these questions you know, when you're doing your research of of the impact of overall value and um, fulfillment in the day-to-day -day, uh try try business is, is definitely something i recommend mm, yeah after having um uh created multiple businesses, I can definitely vouch for it not being so clean. It's a very dynamic effort, but it can be immensely rewarding as well. And for you, so you come from theoretical physics. Um, you are very strong with numbers and statistics. Um, I imagine also abstract thinking and theoretical thinking. Now, your journey in business, what do you think are the biggest challenges for people like you? when you really want to get good at working and having impact on businesses instead of just theoretical concepts? Well, you need to understand the business. That's definitely the first big uh, thing we, uh, we need to I mean, be clear about because with the with the emergence of data science and, and the name data science itself uh, is like a generic thing, no? it's the science of data. I mean, is it really data science? I mean, <laughs> does it really that? Is it really a, it make, does it make sense to talk about the science of data per se? I mean, because in the end, science is usually applied to domains, right? Mm -hmm. It's like uh, you have physics, which has its own domain, you have astrophysics or particle physics or have biology. I mean, in the end, everything has data, right? And uh, and, 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 you, and you, make, you make models, you understand the domain, and you apply, uh, you learn from the data, and you apply models to this domain, right? It's true that at the beginning, that when we have a lot of data to analyze, there are many techniques that you can, of course, uh, re reuse in different domains, and, and they and they give you, I mean, a, a first understanding of things without really looking much into the the particularities of this domain, right? And I guess that's why people start to talk about data science and and all this. But one is becoming mature, and, and businesses are starting to to integrate this in the day to day operations. The domain is, is key, right? And, and you need to understand very well the business. So, so I think we are moving from the generic data science profile to a, to a specialized, let's say, analyst or, or whatever you want to, to call it, uh, that works with the business to understand their data, but uh, as a partner, I mean, as, as part of the business. Uh, and you need to, to speak their language uh, and you need to to get their trust. I think that the trust, having trust is something that is fundamental, right? Because you are, in the end, you are not the business, you are, you are someone who is supporting a business. So you need to, the, the business partners you have, they need to trust that you, what you are de delivering, uh, I mean, provides value and, and and for I mean they don't understand the 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 inners of the of the models, but so in the end, how how can you can they trust what you are providing them to to make decisions? Well, at least you need to speak their language. You need to you need to they need to see that you are understanding the what the, what they are what what they are the issues and and, and things like that. And, and I have seen this many times, right? You may you can you, you come as a data scientist as a new one and then you look at the data and you extrapolate some things or and suddenly you you come to a conclusion and you go to the business and it's something that is obvious it's like everyone knew that i mean <laughs> and you, you might you're very proud because you, you understood this from the data and okay that's fine but in the end it was the business saying, okay yeah so all this fancy data science will to tell me something that i already knew uh, myself without without these techniques all right and or maybe you de develop something that is uh, it's, it's great, but they don't have a way to actually use it. Because uh, when you understand a business, you have to understand what are the tools they're using, right? And you're going to say, okay, now, look, now you have to look at this. Uh, I have created like uh, this model that you, you could check if you go to this link and log in and, and run all these, uh, <laughs> all these steps uh, to get the results. And they will tell you, no, no, I need... I need information because I'm making decisions. Mostly in financial markets, you are making very quick decisions, uh, and they need the information where, where they're working, where they have their maybe the platforms they are using to to deal with the clients or to monitor their trading activity or everything. I mean, you need to deploy things there. Um, and if you don't understand the business and you just build generic tools, they won't use them in the end, right? Uh, they won't trust you. They won't. So this is a, I guess, this is like a great challenge right now for the for the data scientists that is joining businesses is domain expertise uh, and domain meaning yeah uh, the data you understanding the data the data the, the business where the data is coming and how the business is operating so for that you need to 
to spend a lot of time with them, sitting down with them and, and becoming yeah, like a partner, like a one more of the business. Mm. And with you, so we hear this a lot. That of course, you have to work with the technology. So a lot of times what that involves is you sitting behind a computer, you know, running the numbers, working on the algorithms, implementing the technology and all that stuff. But then if you really want to be successful, not just on a technical level, but you want to have real business impact, as you said, and it's, uh, it always comes up that you need to be this translator between data and business. It does involve and does require you to break out of your comfort zone and actually get involved with, uh, uh, with the people in the business. Now, what was your uh, strategy about this in different uh, institutions that you worked at? So BBVA or, or City, what was your strategy of finding the right people to talk to and then building that trust? What kind of questions did you ask? How did you build these strong relationships that could then result in um, um, you know, different fruits in business value? Yeah, I think you always, need to start with, uh, well, um, you need to, to understand that when you, when you are starting a, to work with a business, you, you don't have uh, probably a lot of, of the domain knowledge that you need to, to start uh, creating value, right? And, and so you need to be honest about that. And when you, when you are approaching the, the business people, you, you I mean, you, you in principle have identified uh, you're going to work with. And I mean, the, the, the point of how to identify these people is also it might be different in, in different roles. Right? Sometimes it's obvious because uh, you go to a business and you're, partic you're in a particular business team and, and that's fine and you just work with them. But uh, sometimes it's not. I mean, in my case, for instance, in BBA, I joined, uh, it's a large uh, operation and, and we had a mandate of delivering solutions to pretty much every team, at least team that teams working with, uh, with a lot of data, with a lot of trading. So it, it was not clear whom should you speak to first, right? And for that, um, they are a lot of dynamics, right? First, typically identifying from this business who who are the people more in, most interested in this kind of uh, innovations, let's say. Uh, maybe they are not the, the leaders of the team, but maybe they are uh, on different, I mean, they might be the leaders, but sometimes they are not. And But uh, you want to identify this. And for the, how to do that? Well, I guess it's just a bit of a, top-down approach to start with talking to the managers and, and identifying these people. And what, what you have them, well, uh, at the beginning, we were sort of creating uh, frequent dynamics, uh, like uh, meetings or where we do like brainstorming and show them proof of concepts so, or things that they could potentially get interested, interested with, right? And this, I guess it was, it was an important step in order to, to identify, yeah, who are the people more, most interested also to learn from these people. I mean, you need to be always open to, to learn from them. And uh, because you need to, I mean, you, you go, you, you may, may, may do a prototype with the data, you show them, and then as I said, they, sometimes they say, okay, this is obvious or this cannot work because of this reason or whatever. You need to be always very, very open about, about this critic um, to adapt. And this is the way you are building trust in the end, right? Because um, if, and there is one danger in this industry and I have seen is, is the overhype, right? Uh, I, mean, I think everyone agrees that there is an overhype in the data science, artificial intelligence. And this is something that you can try to use in your benefit, right? Like uh, you could say, okay, I'm the expert in AI and I'm going here and I, 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 I have my model and these are the conclusions. So you are the, you should follow them and so on. But this is not the way to build trust because they, normally when you go with this, you might get some payoff at the beginning, but uh, in the end, if you are not really generating value and probably you are not because business are complicated. Uh, Typically, the first things you can generate with models regarding business are, as I said, are not usable or they are obvious. Or so it's you need to be, yeah, open to to for them to give you feedback and uh, and, uh, and get uh, and be construct construct the model with them and, and refine it and, and so on. Right? It's uh, so yeah. And once as I mentioned, we started with these sort of meetings. Uh, to identify people there. One, once the activity is a bit more mature, uh, uh, you start to moving from the from the prototyping, idea generation, uh, and to start and you start building bottom up, right? Uh, what I have seen is that after this, 
a stage of top down in which people, I mean, there was a strategy of the area, then they did we find one, one key people that we are putting together to do the brainstorming. And you have some prototypes and you start to see some ideas that might work and you can use it in different business. Uh, you cannot keep this forever because uh, at some point, well, it's, a, it's an interesting forum, but people start to lose uh, like uh, focus. Uh, and this is the moment in which you need to go back and start bottom up in the sense like now, now I have identified some of the areas where I can have a larger impact. And then I will sit with them, understand very well their business uh, day to day and start building tools that uh, I think they can, they can benefit from. Um, and hopefully at this time you have generated this trust I mentioned. Um, so you can, so they will trust your solutions uh, and they will use it. Uh, you also will deliver them in the, in the right platforms. So, so they, they can access them in an easy way. Or they don't need to, <laughs> to do like convoluted ways of, of getting the result. Um, and, they, and uh, yeah, and since they trust uh, that you understand their business, well, they will be more open to, uh, to risk. Uh, using these solutions, right? Mm. Still, I mean, there are there are challenges. I mean, it's, it's because I have seen a lot of, for instance, uh, everyone wants to use data and, and say that they are using artificial intelligence in the business, but uh, sometimes uh, there is a, a lot of confirmation bias, for instance, right? Like <clears throat> people, I mean, they tell their the, the managers tell them, I mean, you need to use uh, data science, artificial intelligence, whatever. And they say, okay, well, I will use it, but then you start providing the solutions, but the only ones they feel comfortable are the ones that confirm what they already knew. Um, so they start to build like, uh, uh, just start building things that are generating like, a, well, pretty much what they what they were already thinking. So even though they, they might think they're using your data and your solutions, you are just providing them with uh, something that confirmed their previous knowledge. And that's not a way of creating impact, right? So there are, I mean, this we have to be careful as well when we are, starting to, to build this trust and this partnership with the business that, uh, yeah, we, we are giving them the solutions. We are, we are working with them, they trust us, but uh, we also need to push them to get out of their comfort zone. You know, not just uh, once you get the trust, you need to keep pushing uh, on, on the kind of things you are building to make sure that they, they also see things that they didn't see before and they, and they trust your, your new analytics, your new models beyond the, uh, what they already knew. Hmm. And as you are building this trust and you try to understand what they actually need to make sure that you can have substantial impact on the business itself, what kind of questions do you like to ask from the business user that, that would actually manage to connect your data perspective and their business perspective that would allow you to come up with the right solutions to put it in front of them. Can you think of some of these questions that you'd like to ask? Well, yes, of course. I mean, again, um, the first thing is, I mean, as I said, you need to understand their business. So the question is, what are you doing in your day to day? Uh, can you tell me your journey? I mean, your, what is your user journey? Uh, Let's say you, you start your day and you open this system. Maybe it's, uh, I don't know, it's a salespeople, maybe they have a Salesforce or, or if a, trading, a trader, maybe they open their trading platform, maybe internal or external, whatever. Uh, they start receiving their, or, or they have a look at certain reports, information, or they start trading with the clients or trading with in the markets. Um, and this is uh, this user journey. I mean, you need to get them from, I mean, this is the first question you need to, to ask. I mean, what is, your day to day because this first is you're gonna identify what are the critical things in the in the business, right? What what are they paying attention more? And second, as I said, you are understanding where are where are these these pain points or where are these these things you can uh, you can in principle see analytics uh, working, right? For that, of course, you need to. I always tell these people from from my team and uh, that you need to to already come with a lot of background. Uh, in, in potential solutions, right? So maybe from other businesses or from, from your previous experience, from from books, whatever that they, so when, when you are looking at their user journey, your their, their day to day experience, you see, okay, I think here is where I can make my contribution, right? And they, uh, and you will, um, <clears throat> I, 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 it's something natural. I mean, you see the kind of data they're using, you see the kind of problem they're trying to solve and, and uh, suddenly you identify this, 
this uh, potential benefit for them, right? So, so yeah, I mean, the, the user journey is clear. I mean, you need to ask about the, the day-to-day. Where, where are they using, the, the consuming the information? How are they, what are their concerns uh, in terms of um, sometimes are, I mean, sometimes there are mundane concerns. Like uh, sometimes you see that the, that the business needs uh, in order to, you, you can give them something of value that maybe is not very sophisticated and maybe it's not something that you would like to be working uh, because you, you want to do this fancy model and <laughs> that you have seen in, you know, in the paper or whatever, but but they will they will already see an, an impact from, from you, right? Uh, sometimes I'm talking about, uh, let's say, maybe even just a summary of data in a dashboard, analytics dashboard or something like that, no? Um, but when you sit with them and you see the, the user journey and they tell you about their, their pay points, well, you have to be open. Like maybe, maybe what you can contribute at the first stages is not it's not the complex thing you want to work uh, with, well, that's something that you have the tools to provide them, and they will, and they will, uh, of course, uh, <clears throat> uh, use them and benefit from them. And then, when when you are starting to deploy these these things, uh, you need to ask for the feedback. Uh, of course, I mean the question is, uh, how is this working for you? I mean, how is this? Uh, can you give me examples of of uh, uh, moments where you have used this and and, and give you give you some value? Uh, and this is key because, as I said, you don't want to be doing tools that they don't use, maybe because they, they cannot access. But also, you don't want to be creating tools that they, they just uh, use for confirmation bias. Uh, for <laughs> so you, you need so for that you need to ask a lot of uh, uh, particular examples, let's say, of how how they are benefiting from this and having an open conversation about that. Right? Uh, mm-hmm. and, and you always need to to get their feedback. It is 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 doing right. Is what are the things you are observing that uh, that is that maybe are not working in the some, some corner cases. I don't know. Um, and always with a lot of uh, yeah uh, openness about their. You have to respect their their knowledge. You have to respect the, that they have a lot of years of experience, and that you are not just coming here and so. So yeah, you need to ask about their, their experience. I mean, because mm-hmm. as I said, it's not the, the idea is not necessarily just working on data-driven models, taking data from zero and and, and, and taking out some conclusions without them. I mean, uh, you you need to find ways of combining uh, prior knowledge, as it's usually called, right, with with the with the with your data uh, extrapolations or inferences or whatever. Um, and, and for this is key for the, for you to ask about their experience uh, and their feedback. So this is also uh, some of the key, key components, I guess. And, and this is why you're also building trust, right? I, I always have been very, I, I never try to to go over high my internal clients, my my business partners. Uh, I always respect their knowledge and and, and try to, to get the constructive feedback from them and, and continue building tools that benefit them. And I guess that's that's always been something that uh, that helps the relationship. As I said, it's important that you are open to to help them in in in, in problems that maybe they are not the core ones that you are working with, but but they produce some value already, and uh, and this will help you to to build uh, to to build upon that. And you can also learn. I mean, it's sometimes just by building simple tools, you you learn a lot about the, the data, the way the business operates, the uh, and this will help you later to to be able to build models and self-criticize them uh, mm-hmm. before delivery. And just be more grounded in the actual business challenges. And that really yeah. facilitates your position also as a trusted advisor who actually understands them. And uh, how do you think that the perception of data changed in general in big corporations, but maybe even in the financial industry over the past 10 years? So do you um, see less resistance now in terms of people working with data, are they more open? You talked about the hype before and the trend. This is also settling down a little bit now. So how do you see that data perception evolving over the years? Well, I think financial industry is, is, a, is a special one in some sense. I mean, I'm not saying it's the only one in this case, but the, it, it's been always, I mean, since 70s, 60s, I don't know, it's super data driven. I mean, we, we had data, they had data for a long time, right? So, so and as I said, the, the traditional quantitative analysts, the quants, uh, they they use data in, the, in their day-to-day works. It's true that the, the core 
activity was more on this complex derivatives and so on, where with these mathematical models that maybe are not are, they're based more on, on a theoretical framework uh, instead of just learning models from data, but still things like, I don't know, PCA, uh, linear regression, and more, mostly, I mean, maybe some, some of something which is sort of Manila right now, maybe for the machine learning world, but these things were day to day, and they didn't call it machine learning, but it was the day to day. So, so in that sense, uh, data is not new for the financial industry. They have been using analytics tools, for instance, streaming analytics. Uh, there's been a lot of streaming analytics uh, years ago, right? Uh, building all kind of uh, indicators. Sometimes it's, uh, it's true that the, the scientific ways, I get maybe what, what it was sort of lacking in, in some cases, no? And still is lacking in, in a lot of the industry, right? For instance, all this thing that is called a technical analysis, um, which is uh, pretty much uh, looking at spurious patterns in, in, in data, which is not really scientific. It's just the, well, this, this was, this was, and it still is, uh, a big uh, part of the financial industry. So maybe they were using data, but in many cases they were not using it in a scientific way, right? Or a method with a strong methodology where you can sort of have uh, a theory that is proved or disproved uh, because of the data. Because if, if it was that the case, many of the things we observe today, like uh, yeah, observing patterns in, in time series of prices and, and thinking that you can sort of extrapolate from these patterns as they do in technical analysis, it's, uh, it would have been really deprecated. Uh, uh, so I guess the, the culture of data existed, but not a scientific culture. And I guess that's what changed with the, in the recent years. Now we see more, now we have specialists in data, uh, data science, which in the data science is a very scientific uh, discipline, right? And, and they're bringing this, <clears throat> this more systematic way of, of analyzing the tons of data that there was always in the business, right? Um, of course, with this, all the new fancy tools are also trying to be used. I mean, it's now everyone is becoming uh, for excited with uh, neural networks and partner learning and, and everything. <clears throat> Although, honestly, I don't think the impact of these sophisticated tools is as big as in in other in other areas because I mean, in the end, financial markets have as a data set, they have a lot of noise. So, so all these complex nonlinear models not necessarily get you much further than simple ones. It depends on the case, but this definitely not, it's not a revolution we are seeing in other areas like uh, visual, rec I mean, yeah, visual recognition or uh, translation, uh, things like that, right? Like we, we are just, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's more the, I think it's what the impact really is being more the scientific way than the, advanced tools, I would say, um, because uh, things like backtesting, that is, which is like looking at your models in the past, but now are make, they're made more rigorously with, with all the, the typical ideas from from data science of splitting your data set in a train set, maybe a test set, and uh, and then being uh, being critical of the model you have calibrated in, in data that you've never seen. I mean, you, for a data science, it might be surprising that there are people who, who don't do this with the data, but this is, has been a a, a very, very typical way of working in, in the financial data sets in the past. Like uh, you just calibrate a model to a historical data and, it, <laughs> and this is a paper. Uh, and you, do, you don't challenge your model that the, what, what is, if it performs well in data that never was never seen, no? Actually, mm -hmm. it's, it's, uh, this is like a joke saying like uh, that for the, 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 stock, the American stock market the, uh, time series, let's say end of day prices of the last century, like the most overfit data set ever existed, like a, because everyone has tried to has tried to apply models and tried to get patterns there without really a much of a scientific critique of, of the results, right? So, so yeah, if I <clears throat> I think this is the key, the scientific way. I mean, there, there's been also other things like uh, alternative data is called right? like uh, we're starting to look at other data sets that are not the traditional ones, uh, like prices and volumes, trades, and things in the financial markets. But we are looking at other kind of non-structured information, right? Like uh, maybe uh, social uh, tweets, let's say, right? Or uh, Facebooks or, or maybe pictures like satellite pictures of uh, in order to try to predict some of the uh, key indicators, right? Maybe you want to understand uh, how is inflation before before it's published officially by the by, by the government or so you want to to look at this data directly. So this is a lot of raw data. And, um, uh, and there is a lot of interest on these kind of things as well. I guess that's another 
another trend. But if I, if I have to say one thing is, is the scientific way. If we, mm. what it's changing. And what are you most <laughs> excited about now in terms of maybe new solutions, um, uh, advanced tools, uh, any kind of trend, maybe just in the wider data world or more specifically in the financial industry? Well, a few things, yeah. Um, on the one hand, I mean, in terms of the more machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence things, I guess uh, I like a lot the, the causal models, which is something that we are starting to explore more and more. I mean, there has been a lot of, in the last years, uh, everyone was thinking that really the, what it would make an impact in financial markets were, was like more data and data driven, things like, I don't know, like in DeepMind, right? Like deep reinforcement learning and things like that, where you are learning, for instance, at trading a strategy completely from the data. But I think that's getting a bit stuck. Um, I see a lot of players that used to to say they're doing a lot of research on this, but then suddenly it's not that, uh, yeah, that, that, that they don't have a lot of diffusion of that anymore. Uh, I guess it's because in the end it's difficult to, this is not like a, a I don't know, when you're playing Go or chess or something like that, that you have a, a, a very well-defined set of rules and, and a very de a deterministic environment where you can work on with these sophisticated tools. Right? Financial markets are change all the time. I mean, they're not they're not stationary. The data is very noisy, and and when and, and, and your actions uh, produce a lot of impact in the in the market, right? So when you try to to deploy this sort of data-driven models to build the strategies and things like that. Uh, you get a lot of problems with the data you are training the models with because uh, either you don't have enough data or the data is you don't know in the historical data you don't know what would have been the impact of your strategy if you had used it in the real market so you you, you lack that and you need to simulate that and maybe the simulation is, is not right because you, are, you have to do a lot of uh, assumptions on how the market would have be behaved if you were acting on the market right so, so I, I think this is not, a, at least for me, it's not so exciting anymore. And, and causal models is different because these models, uh, as I said, they, they are good in the things that I was mentioning before. You, you you can bring some of the domain expertise into the model because you you need to to already introduce some of the relationships between the, the variables you're looking at, but um, <clears throat> they can learn from, from less data thanks to this prior knowledge you are providing, but still they are rigorous models. It's not like uh, I'm, I'm doing like a old fashioned on rules that business used to do, I mean, like just based on heuristics and things like that. You are really working on um, proper data-driven models, but with a lot of information that we can put uh, from from the business. Uh, uh, and particularly in the causal models, you can use them not only to to understand correlations between the data, but also to understand interventions, which for the, as I said, in the case of the financial markets is very important. What is going to be? What happens if I buy uh, this order in the market? Um, how will react? Uh, uh, how the market will react? Right. And this is something you need to to understand this impact beforehand. I mean, and, and this is sort of kind of intervention in the data that uh, is not just purely a correlation. You need, it's, you're doing an action into the in, into the environment, and, and, and this will produce a feedback, right? And, and this this kind of uh, analysis you cannot do with traditional machine learning models. So you need this kind of causal models. So that. Definitely, I think it's, it's exciting. I think we're gonna hear more and more about that. These models are becoming more efficient, uh, more mainstream with frameworks what you can use and so on. And I think they will add a lot of impact. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that in terms of, of, of models. So of course, uh, there are other things where we are seeing uh, in terms of, for instance, infrastructure, of course, as everyone is talking, uh, we are moving to the cloud, right? Uh, Cloud-based tools is, 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 is a big, uh, trend right now in not only for data in general for for training uh, we're even seeing now exchanges that are moving to the like like nasdaq for instance they're, they're having a plan with amazon to to move to, with aws to to move to the cloud and i think every 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 big player is is playing with this right like they're moving to to cloud infrastructure and, and in terms of data well you have a lot of opportunities right because you're getting a a very mature ecosystem that you can provide from uh, that, that that the cloud providers are giving you to, to build your models to, to deploy them to analyze your data and so on so so this is definitely a big thing but it's a, it's a difficult one because traditionally banks are very uh, well 
they, they don't trust much uh, the, the the cloud infrastructure in terms of security and and privacy and there is a lot of regulation risk right with what happens with your client data and so on so so the, the move has been probably much slower than other industries but it's definitely something we are moving to and, and we are BBA, we are also looking at this very seriously now mm. um and of course i mean the final thing i would mention is all this crypto thing right <laughs> everyone is very excited about that uh well my opinion is uh there is definitely crypto is something where there is a lot of speculation and, and it's still to see the we, we, we are still to see the application that goes beyond pure speculation right because it's uh, i mean it's fine i mean when you buy something and it goes up and, and you get rich is everyone is happy right but the but in the end financial industry it needs to provide solutions that for for real problems business problems and we are in the end funding business uh allowing them to or to manage the risk whatever but the but uh, the, there needs to be a connection with with the reality. Not not the blockchain is fine, the crypto is fine, but it's still very isolated into their own ecosystem. Still, there is a lot of innovation there. And for instance, things like the decentralized finance, it's a, it's an amazing field. A lot of uh, algorithmic training is going to have a lot of influence on these things. Uh, there is also a lot of data. One nice thing about the crypto world is that data is typically free. Uh, for instance, I, I teach uh, at the MBA in uh, Institute of Empresa, which is uh, one of the, the main MBAs on the, well, in the top ranking in the in the world. Um, and I, I teach algorithmic training them, but for the business people, right? And and, and the, the data we show them is typically from crypto because it's, I mean, I cannot just go and because, uh, we don't have a license out of the bank to give free data to, to my students, but uh, uh, crypto data for, so far is typically uh, for free, right? So this is it's great because in terms of innovation of people analyzing this data, uh, we have a lot of people who, who don't have this barrier of entrance that we have traditionally in the financial industry, right? That you, you need to be in a big institution that will pay the high fees to get access to the market data, which is really, really high, high fees. I mean, it's very, very costly. Uh, in this case, it's free data. So people are doing a lot of uh, analysis, uh, applying machine learning models and algorithmic training and everything uh, with a very low barrier of entrance. So it's, 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 a, it's really exciting in that sense. Mm -hmm. But I think we still need to see, as I say, the killer application of this thing of making vision and speculation. But it's exciting. Definitely. Mm. Uh, actually, you brought this up and that, this was going to be one of my questions, what you think about the whole crypto revolution, because I imagine it's a massive disruptor for finance. Just what you mentioned from a data perspective, the digital nature of the currency and the transactions, this opens up a whole new vista of data accessibility. It's really exciting to watch unfold. I mean, I'm you know, in no shape or form a crypto expert. I've been observing that whole space, especially from the perspective of the war of narratives, because this is what we see now a lot, that all these uh, new technologies, trends, things with different levels of hype, they compete against each other. Right. So even in crypto, if you look at the solutions, there are many solutions that do have good fundamentals, something like, uh, you know, Cardano uh, or uh, Polkadot. These work with smart contracts and they are trying to address uh, real problems. Now, where you see is that it's not necessarily the solution with the most uh, found technological uh, uh, basis that will win, but those who manage to winning the war of narratives. So this is also a whole new competition because back in the day when there were fewer of these solutions out there, uh, you could really rely on the technological foundation to just carry the whole thing on its back. But now with the heightened narratives, not just in business, but just in general, people are bombarded with so many messages or thresholds are so high yeah. to be stimulated by anything to get someone to buy into something, it's becoming more and more difficult. And that even leads us back to the conversation about data of why should people care now that the the uh, hype is dying down a little bit you are competing against other things in the business you know they they don't really necessarily take data as a priority it's your job as a person working with data knowing the potential in that to 
to win in that narrative battle and get that person to care about what you can offer and actually adopt these solutions and change their way of working and have an impact on the business at large. So that's why I'm so interested in watching these technologies compete against each other and these trends kind of clashing in that space of ideas. Great. Definitely. I mean, and, and it's true that it happens that, I mean, I can see from the data science world, definitely like really when the, when the hype is starting to fade away is when the things are actually becoming more interesting because we have been out of years trying to build uh, things with data and, and there were a lot of things we didn't have like uh, first the trust I mean, from the business. So they didn't really trust our solution so we couldn't really provide value until uh, we proved them that we are fit to the to the task, but also the infrastructure, like building the, the data pipelines, cleaning it, uh, connecting to the relevant system and so on. So, and now we see sort of <laughs> value, right? I guess in crypto, it's gonna be the same. For instance, for this, as you said, there are many competing narratives, very competing propositions, and everyone is very excited, but mostly for the speculation part, I guess. But uh, when, when all this goes, the, the, techn the underlying technology is gonna be uh, really disruptive. Maybe it will be disruptive really when, when it loses the original purpose of decentralization. I, my opinion, honestly, is that it probably the big disruption would come when, when the traditional players like the central bank and so on start to issue their own cryptos. But because then at least you will have the connection with, with, with the real world, not only the connection with the, within the crypto space, which is now very nice, but you can sort of like borrow, I mean, you can replicate all the finance in, in the crypto world, but, but it's still the, within the crypto world. If I, if mm -hmm. I want to, Put something out of it like uh, my dollar account it's uh, it, it's not there it, it, there's no one who will uh, sort of enforce mm -hmm. uh, that part uh, for you i mean for that this governance and so on i guess but i mean that's my opinion anyway mm -hmm. yeah i think it's, it's it's something really really interesting to look at uh, and, and, and as a financial industry we cannot just relax and and see it go i mean we need to understand what is going on and and, and when the moment comes to jump into it because definitely there is a lot of potential disruption to the industry. I don't think it's going to disappear as people say because of the smart contract will replace banks and so on. In the end, people need to, honestly, the, the, I mean, intermediation always emerges. It's just people don't want to handle things themselves. Uh, <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, it's like a, in the original internet, right? I mean, you don't want to have your own server and your own web page and your own email uh, address. I mean, just go to Gmail and in the end, uh, so the blockchain is the same. I mean, there might be peer-to-peer -peer contracts and so on, and this that is fine. But for most of the people, they don't want to be understanding what what is this code is doing, and so there will be intermediates in there that that uh, intermediaries that will provide the services to help uh, deal with this uh, this kind of uh, technologies, right? Mm -hmm. But there will be a lot of disruption in traditional players. So if you don't start looking at it, uh, I guess it's mm -hmm. something that can can make you out of business in a few years. And, and adoption will be key, right? Because again, we can look at an idea, yeah. we can look at technology, but just take the smartphone, which managed to overtake the world. Now, the first smartphone, we all remember the first iPhone and we associate that with the, oh, that was, that, that, that was where the concept of the smartphone was born. And it's just not true. Like many other manufacturers, I think definitely Microsoft, I think even Samsung, maybe even Sony, had their own smartphones years before the iPhone. It just didn't get traction. They didn't really find the right way to present it to the market and actually connected a business user on the right frequency. And that's what Steve Jobs with his branding genius actually managed to do of, of really tuning into that, uh, into that perspective of the person who will use the end product really push the right buttons and make that solution irresistible. And that's when the mass adoption happened, when that reached that critical mass. And then it was basically wildfire. And a lot of these innovations that might be super useful and they might actually target real problems, a lot of them will just disappear because um, it won't reach the target audience in the, in the narrative space. Javier, this was uh, fantastic. Thank you very much for your input. It's been uh, super interesting to look at how, you know, data drivenness actually gained traction in the financial industry. And then from the perspective of someone like you actually on the ground, coming from a theoretical background, how you, how you are managing and navigating that space. Uh, any word of advice uh, to our listeners who might be in a similar situation to you coming from a similar background, uh, what would be your recommendation and personal advice to aspiring data leaders? Well, 
uh, as I said, we are, I think we are now in the, uh, from the data science point of view, in the best moment in time. I, I think I can feel that. We are really, uh, right now, uh, we have the tools, we have, hopefully you have the trust with your business partners, uh, you understand the data sets, you understand the, the domain, uh, and this is not where we can start seeing a lot of uh, applications to, to produce impact. And maybe it's not longer the main topic of the big presentations that people are doing in the <laughs> for the strategy of the of your company and everything, but now is where you are really giving value in the day to day. It's not marketing; it's it's real value, right? So, I think that's that's my advice. I to stick with it. Like uh, this is the the, the great moment uh, for 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 a data science leader to to keep transforming the business. Uh, when as I said, when the hype starts to disappear, but now we have all the all the foundations laid in order to build uh, real impact uh, solutions. Impact solutions mm -hmm. yeah. So seize the day and take advantage of the opportunity. Fantastic. Javier, thank you very much for your insights. Keep enjoying sunny Madrid. You know, hopefully uh, towards the end of the year, I can join you if I manage to move there and then uh, hope to have you on the show in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me. It was really great. My pleasure. Thank you.